All right, it looks like um, people are still trick trickling in, but let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to our webinar, CX Pays, Three Ways to Drive CX ROI in B2B and B2B2C companies. Thanks for joining us today. So let's go ahead and get started here while folks continue to trickle in. My name is Lisa Harala. I'm the Marketing Operations Manager here at Heart of the Customer. And I'd like to start uh, by letting you all know that this webinar is being recorded and we will send a link to the recording and to the slides uh, after uh, we conclude here by the end of the week for sure. So we'll have access to that. In today's webinar, we'll talk about linking customer experience or CX to business value in the B2B and B2B to, B, B2B to C spaces. So we'll discuss aligning your CX program with business objectives, communicating the financial impact of CX initiatives, and what exactly separates a CX change maker from a hopeful. So throughout the presentation, please feel free to utilize the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to ask any questions that come up. Uh, we'll hold designated time towards the end of the presentation to answer those questions. And if we don't get to all of them, we're happy to follow up afterwards. So please feel free to ask away if anything comes to mind throughout the presentation. So before we begin, we'd like to start with a quick poll. Uh, I will pull this up and you should see it on your screen. All right, how comfortable are you connecting CX to financial value? So I'll give you 30 seconds or so to submit an answer and then we'll show, show the results. All right. Yes, we love this helps me uh, as I build up my answers by uh, examples as I can see what people are saying today. So um, clearly strong majority for I understand the concept not how to do it. Hum a few bars and I'll fake it. Uh, thanks, my friends up there. I wish all promoters and tractors churn at different levels and we connect everything to financial outcomes. One of the 30. So uh, fantastic. Uh, as you would guess, this is a topic we can go into in great detail. Uh, I was at the CXPA Leaders Exchange, uh, or, um, along with Jen, just this week. I, I flew in from uh, Orlando this morning, and this is a big topic we talked about there. So let's go ahead and hop into it then, as we look at um, this concept. And I stepped right over your lines, Lisa. That's okay. Take it away. <laughs> All right. So I, I'm Jim Tincher, uh, founder at Heart of the Customer. Uh, we'll, in October, we'll celebrate 10 years, as well as uh, founder, that's uh, right, author, co-author of the book, How Hard Is It to Be Your Customer? Using Journey Mapping to Drive Customer-Focused Change, and then also the author of the book, Do Be to Be Better. And before we start talking about the financials, I want to talk about you, and I want to ask you, why do you do CX? Oops, went too far. Why do you do CX? I like you put in the chat. Why do you do customer experience? So go ahead and put in the chat, why are you in this field? All right, so let's go ahead and get that there. It's help our customers get the jobs they've done. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, to see what drives value for them. All right, Michael. Good to see you, Michael. Uh, Melanie, because we want our existing clients happy and retained. To improve experiences, to improve, it, improve retention from Patty. All the above aligns with cultural values. All of what we're here to serve customers, improve experience and loyalty, to help enhance our value, to drive um, our service to drive value, drive happiness, uh, working to validate operational improvements by linking with customer value. So we don't look stupid. All right. Lots of good answers here. Now, I want you for a minute to think about your most critical stakeholder. The person inside the organization you most need to get on your side and support the customer experience. And now I want you to think that you're at one of their webinars. Okay. What are the odds 
that they're going to say the same things when they think about customers. Odds are pretty low. And so um, it's really one of the things that we find is that um, really there's a disconnect. When we look at how we and customer experience sound to the rest of the business, well, this is what we often sound like. I don't know if you've ever run across this, but commonly we sound like you know, survey folks. We talk about survey, talk about research, but when the rest of the business talks to each other, this is what they sound like. They talk about money. They may talk about hard metrics, but no other organization, another other part of the organization uses surveys as their primary source of data. And this sets up a disconnect between how we talk and how the rest of the business is talking to each other. And the question is, what kind of conversation would you prefer to have? The good news is we can have that type of financial conversation. We'll talk about how to do that. Now, it's not just my perception. If we look at the research from Pointillist, you may be familiar that Pointillist was purchased by Genesis a couple of years ago. And in 2019, they put out their state of customer journey management and CX measurement. And the number one issue was quantifying customer experience ROI. When they asked customer experience leaders, what's your biggest challenge? Proving that what we do is worthwhile, proving that it has a financial impact. 2020, they asked the question again. Top issue is quantifying customer experience ROI. Now, anybody care to guess what was the top in 2021? You probably had to be here. It was again, quantifying customer experience ROI. It's a challenge, but it doesn't have to be. Now also in 2019, Customer Think came out with some research uh, on um, what separates the best programs from the rest. They had three levels, beginning, developing, and okay, get ready. What's the top level? Winning. Now, I, I don't normally hear people talk about winning customer experience programs, but that's what they called it, winning programs. And the winning programs were those who could show that their work truly impacted the business. They created either competitive difference or financial outcome for their work. And it was only one out of four. Now, this research got my team and I interested a few years back. We wanted to understand what is it that separates some of the best from the rest. And so we talked to over 200 customer experience leaders, surveyed hundreds more to get to the bottom of what separates the best from the rest. And we determined there's two types of customer experience programs. And I'd like you to ask yourself, which one are you? Those are the hopeful and the change maker. The hopeful is doing good work. Now she's analyzing the survey, she's sharing the results, she's broadcasting throughout the organization, but she can't prove that her work is leading to an outcome where customers want to spend more, stay longer, and interact in ways less expensive to serve. Because those are the outcomes that your leaders care about. Now, when I was at the CXPA Leaders Exchange, um, Advance, sorry, Leaders Advance, I talked to a number of people and asked them, what are you looking to learn here? The most common answer I got was, I wanna learn how to get my leaders on board with customer experience. So great. What is the customer's behavior you're looking to change? And the answer I got back often is, I wanna make it easier for customers. I want customers to enjoy it more. I had to say, well, that's great. Not the question I asked you. The question is, what customer's behavior do you want to change? You see, if we were to sum up the difference between a hopeful and a change maker into one sentence, it would be that hopefuls report on sentiment. Net promoter score, customer satisfaction, customer effort score. But change makers study and change behaviors. And that's the key, is that 
you want to change your customers' behaviors because again, it comes back to you want to create an environment where customers want to stay longer, uh, spend more, and interact in ways less expensive to serve. That's the outcome we should be looking to create. Where they want to do that, not where we're trapping them, they want to. And that's the behavior we want to change. And that's what a change maker does. And that blew me away. So when we did this research, I spent two days at UKG, Ultimate Kronos Group, uh, with Roxy Strominger. She's on the board of the CXPA along with me. Uh, two days at Dow Chemical, learning about them, as well as all those different interviews. I also shadowed um, Nancy Flowers from Hagerty at the time, a Darren Byrne at Walters Clore Financial Services to really understand what's different. And their ability to talk in data was a key difference. And uh, one of the more popular blog posts I put out this last year is about the CX leader of the future. Now the CX leader of today, the net promoter score from this last quarter is 27. It's an increase in three points. The top driver is ease of doing business with us. It's interesting. Not language that your peers are used to hearing from their peers and not what they're looking for. Here's what the customer experience leader of tomorrow will sound like. Thanks for coming to our quarterly update. Now, as many of you know, our net revenue retention is 103%. As a reminder, net revenue retention is a combination of churn and changes in spending of existing customers. So we started the last year, or we ended last year with 2,150 customers. Net revenue retention says of those 2,150, not counting any new customers, how much did they spend this year as a proportion of last year's? Well, we had a 5% churn rate, but those who are still here increased their spending by, by um, 9%, which means our net revenue retention is 103%. Now we look at those who took the survey, their net revenue retention is 105%. So clearly the number one strategy to get our sales to go better is for everybody to take the survey and everybody laughs. Okay, maybe they don't laugh, but anyway. So now let's go into what's driving our net revenue retention. And the overall, thanks Jen, <laughs> Jen laughed. <laughs> the overall net revenue retention, the biggest driver is whether customers had confidence in us. Those customers who were confident only churned at 2% and the net revenue retention is 115%. Those customers who said are frustrated with us churned at 18% and their net revenue retention was only 65%. Now the next natural question is what drives confidence or frustration? The number one driver of frustration is a complaint that goes unresolved for more than a week. We can have complaints as long as we resolve them quickly, but when they linger for more than a week, then our customers report being more frustrated. The biggest driver of confidence is consistent on-time delivery of our products. We don't have to be perfect, but as long as we go surpass 90% on-time delivery, then our customers report being more confident. When our delivery drops below 80%, well, that's when our customers build more frustration as well. Now, as you all know, we've had some delivery issues in the Northeast where our on-time delivery has dropped down to about the 80% mark. And so we have started to see more frustration popping up in our surveys in the Northeast. So as a result, I'm predicting our net revenue retention will drop next year in the Northeast. That's what the customer experience leader of tomorrow will talk like. And the cool news is you can do that today by using more and tying everything into financials and operational metrics. I'm not gonna go in today about measuring emotions. That'll be a future topic. I've done some work on that. You can find on the website. Um, and I'm not going to talk as much about behavioral and operational data today, but this net revenue retention is a topic of today. 
Net revenue retention, we'll talk about coming up here in a few minutes, is my favorite financial metric to use in most industries. Now, in my book, Do Be To Be Better, I introduce this concept of the customer experience loyalty flywheel. That is that when you invest in the customer experience, well, hey, it gets better. Okay, hopefully that follows. From there then, customers become more emotionally engaged. They spend more, stay longer, interact in ways less expensive to serve, and therefore the company gets healthier. Now, you might look at this model and say, well, duh, Jim. Yeah, of course that works. I mean, that, that's why we do customer experience work, and it is. But the model is not what separates a change maker from a hopeful. It's how they measure it. And that when you invest in the customer experience, you look at the customer ecosystem data, the behavior, operational, descriptive, and we're talking about today, the financial data. So that when you improve it, you measure it with surveys, but you also look at the operational behavioral data that you measure an emotional North Star like confidence, frustration. You look at behavioral data and especially financial data. So example, for example, a confident customer, their net revenue retention is higher. And then you bring on the overall final values such as customer lifetime value, net revenue retention, annual recurring revenue. That's what a change maker looks at. Now again, today we're going to focus on the financial aspect. The book goes into all these different parts and they surround all this with change management. Now, a couple of months ago, I was talking with a large B2B organization. You'd know their name. And uh, the director of customer insights asked, why do I need to connect my CX data to financials? Nobody's asking me to do it. Why should I? Well, a big part of it comes back to budget. So I want you to picture yourself as the CEO. CEOs are under tremendous pressure to show value, to show a healthy bottom line and to show growth. And as a result, there's a lot of turnover at the CEO level. So you are now the CEO. Now picture yourself with your favorite, your, your CEO's face here. And somebody comes to you and they say, hey, I've got a project it's going to improve net promoter score by 20 points. Okay. You're a customer focused CEO. You said, well, that's pretty good. I like that a lot. But you can only fund one project. Somebody else comes and says, my project will create a million dollars in cost savings. Well, who's going to get the money? It's going to go to the million dollars in cost savings every time. And that's what hurts our capability is because you can't spend NPS points. But what if instead you're able to say that same project will generate $3 million in retention revenue and $2 million in additional cross sales? Now you're in the game. At our B2B, our Do B2B Better conference last year, a Roxy from UKG showed a spreadsheet she has that actually shows when they improve scores on their surveys. Here's the financial impact of that. That's a true change maker capability. Now, this thing more about showing financial value, I have a poll for you. Uh, which executive does your CEO see as most critical? So go ahead up there and say, which one, single choice, do you think is most critical? Does your CEO see as most critical? So IBM asked this question. And um, they could choose more than one. We're having you just choose one and say, which executive is most critical to the CEO? All right, so get your choices in there. And oh, it looks like we get the answer. Here we go. Yes, CFO. Okay, you picked up uh, the theme here. Uh, we see the second choice was a chief operating officer. And good job. Anyway, third was CIO, which is also right. So according to IBM, who asked this question every year, essentially the CFO and COO were tied. Again, they could choose more than one. CIO is third. You know, CMO is fourth, only 19% of CEOs selecting them. 
But who's missing? Chief customer officer didn't make the cut. Even the CMO, who most of us spend our time working with, is way down the list. Now we're doing these interviews. I would ask the participants, again, these are CX leaders. If I were to ask you whether the customer experience is getting better or worse, how would you answer me? Easily the most common answer was I'd look at my surveys. It makes sense. Then I would ask, how would your CEO answer that same question? It's usually a pause and the most common answer was, well, those same surveys. Yeah, I don't know that your CEO is spending any time looking at surveys. The third question though was, how would your favorite finance person answer the same question? And that got crickets. In fact, one participant told me, well, Jim, you're assuming I know somebody from finance. Like, oh yeah, you got me. I did assume you knew somebody from finance, but it turns out that was a bad assumption because most of us in CX spend zero time with finance. But you see here, the CFO is the most important person your CEO is depending upon. And if they can't represent the work you're doing, you're probably going to have a hard time getting your funding. Now, my favorite answer probably is Lisa Hagen. Uh, she was with Walter Sklor Financial Services. I mentioned her in my first book. Um, she's now with a credit union, draw a blank of the name. Uh, um, I also wrote about her in the second book when she was Walter Sklor. And she said, well, when I asked her, if I were to ask you whether customer experience is getting better or worse, how would you answer it? She said, well, I'd look at the surveys. My heart drops. And then she says, but then I'd also look at, do we have more complaints coming into the contact center? Are we having retention issues or are we adding on new upsells and cross sells? And my heart sprung back to life. And that's the answer. That's how we need to answer because that's what the rest of the organization looks at. So what I'm going to do now is walk through seven financial metrics to consider and one to avoid. That's probably your favorite. The first one is cost to serve. Now, this is a great way to show short-term impact. It's commonly done from avoidance of complaints or calls in the contact center. There are other ways too. It's a really good way to show impact in the short term. But most executives get excited and get promoted through growth. So use this for the short term, as well as its cousin retention. Uh, I guess they're not cousins, but before you look at more of the revenue-based ones. Retention's a big deal too, uh, but don't just show net promoter score and how it affects retention. Show what underlies that. What's happening within your survey that caused retention? Like, for example, is it um, satisfaction with service staff? Is it confidence in the product? Use those underlying drivers that connect them to retention. Share of wallet is even more than net revenue retention is my favorite. And share of wallet, if you're not familiar with that, is if your customer spends a million dollars in your category, you know, buying doors. Your, your customer is a construction company. They spend a million dollars in doors. How much of that million dollars do you get? In B2B and B2B to C, this is often the most important factor. There's only one problem. It's often impossible to get the real number. Unless you specifically ask your customers in a survey how much they're spending in your category, most industries can't tell how much is actually being spent by the customers, and you need that to show share of wallet. Um, you can get proxies by getting them to go to additional categories, for example, but share of wallet is really cool if you can get it, but most can't get it. Order velocity. Are they buying more from us? Are they buying more frequently? Have they spent more last year than last year? Uh, we're working with the life insurance company and this, we are looking at how do we score the success of our customer experience? And that's what we're using. 
is do our advisors bring more business to us? While there may be individual advisors that have issues, if you look across the book, this order velocity, how often they come to us and how much they spend is a really good metric that especially your sales team cares about, but so does your CEO. Order velocity again is how frequently they order or how many dollars they order or how much margin they order is even better. I like to track it this year versus last. Next is customer lifetime value. Now this is an interesting one. Uh, it was the most common one in the interviews that people use is CLTV or LTV or CLV. It has three different acronyms and about 50 different ways to calculate it. Now at its basic, most basic, it is how much a customer spends in a year times how long you expect them to remain a customer. It's that last part that gets tricky because how do you know how long they'll stay? You have to make assumptions and assumptions underlie this whole thing. If you are creating a CLV without finances help, it's not believable. Now CLV can get way more complicated. And my very favorite way of measuring CLV, one of our clients, this is literally from their playbook how they calculate customer lifetime value. Please don't ask me to explain that. I, I don't understand it at all. We, we didn't use this metric because uh, I, I was a political science major. Uh, so, but anyway, you get quite, yes, Alicia, yeah, that's something else. Um, I don't know what it means. And uh, so we're not using that one. But uh, if you have a customer lifetime value created by your finance group, it's a great tool. Um, annual recurring revenue this is what I talked about earlier. If you had last year, a thousand customers all spending hundred dollars each, then you look at those same thousand customers, how much they spend this last year. So you take, let's say uh, you take May 1st, 2022 and the trailing 12 months of revenue. For just those same customers, you look at how much they spent this year. One of our clients found that 20% of their customers attrited, left, but those who remained increased their spending enough so that their net revenue retention was 87%. So that would mean the remaining, oh, I can't do the math on the fly, getting poli sci major. Uh, the remaining 80% must have purchased about, I don't know, increased their spending by like eight or 9% in order to allow it to be 88 overall numbers over. Anyway, it combines churn and changes in spending. And it's the best metric to show your value. It doesn't work in every industry. Uh, for example, there may not be upsells, but if it, in many industries it does, and it's the one I recommend you use. Um, well, sure, that's actually net revenue retention. Oh, sorry, Jim. Uh, again, I was up early this way. Uh, annual recurring revenue is actually a, a SaaS one on how much we are getting just from the product sales over time. Uh, net revenue retention, what I mean, is one I recommend you use. So these seven metrics are really good ones. Uh, which is the one to avoid? The one you're likely using, which is referrals. So on, um, um, yeah, overly complex, yes. Well, which one's overly complex, overly complex Emily? I'd love to hear. You want to chat out there? Oh, that was the um, formula that you showed, Jim. Oh, the formula. Okay, yes, yes. All right. Yeah, that was a Woo! little glitch. Yeah. All right. So you know, a lot of us are tying to referrals. I mean, why wouldn't we? It's We use the likelihood to recommend score. So why won't we measure referrals? Well, first reason is, um, all right, thanks, Jen. Uh, the first reason is, and the major reason is, can you prove the referrals exist? So Emily hopped on just a minute ago. She's working with Link Logistics, which is a landlord for, um, for industrial property, think warehouses. And if Emily was to tie her success to referrals coming in, net, again, net promoter score is how likely they recommend us. The only way she can do that is if she can prove which of the sales happen because of a referral. Now, if you're a bank that offers a toaster for a referral or $50, whatever, 
then this is a good metric for you. More likely, especially if you're a B2B or B2B to C company, you have a field in Salesforce, whatever CRM you have, that asks if we got them from referral. You have three sales reps in Toledo who fill it out and nobody else does. I was talking to somebody at the Leaders um, Advance who said she'd been trying to build a model showing financial results from referrals, but she couldn't get any data on what business they got from referrals. And that's true for you as well, I'm almost positive. Now, again, if you have a referral program where somebody gets a benefit like 50 bucks, toast or whatever it is, then yes, I would use that all day long. I would tie all my survey scores to that to show the value. But for the vast majority of us, don't talk about referrals. Uh, Michael, we're not going to talk about AI today. Uh, that's still uh, it'd be an interesting topic for the future. Um, uh, the integration is a key part of that. But uh, I want to say here again, the, the things you want to look at are these seven. And you want to validate with finance that you're actually able to move the needle in these areas. So your three actions of a change maker is number one, go fishing, specifically for data. Number two, change your dependent variable. I'll talk about what I mean by that. And number three, use these drivers to drive change. The first thing is, let's go fishing for some data. And that fishing begins with finance. I know finance is scary. I mean, they wear a tie, at least according to this clip art. Um, the, um, oh, okay, Michael. So, um, but yeah, so start with finance. Because finance is reporting on what's important to the CEO. If the CEO cares about ARR and annual recurring revenue, then you should tie to that. If they care about net revenue retention, tie into that. Maybe they care about order velocity. Find out what they care about. And odds are, they can get you the data you need. So start with finance, meet with them. Now, um, Tabitha Dunn is the president, uh, the chair of the board, I guess, of the CXBA. And um, she gave a presentation last week where she talks about how she does a um, road show every quarter with all of her critical stakeholders, including finance. Start with finance, learn what they have, find out what they're talking about, and then odds are they can help you with the data. Now, this first time you do it, you don't need an ongoing feed. You just need to extract at one point. So you can do the analysis we'll talk about in a minute. But start by meeting with finance because they have your CEO's ear. So find out what they're saying into that ear so you can say much the same thing. So some possible examples of uh, data you'd use. So if a metric you're looking at, for example, is cost to serve, well, the most common place to look at is cost to serve is the contact center. So choose one type of call, find out how many calls people are receiving, find out the cost per call, and so you can analyze your survey data against that. Which, by the way, if you do nothing else coming out of this webinar, find out how much it costs you per call if you have a call center. Most of the CX folks I talk to don't know that number. And if you have any hope of showing ROI, it starts with there by finding out how much it costs for a call to the contact center. And as you look to cut cost to serve, that's one of the fastest ways to do it. Now, if we look at retention, in that case, uh, most customers don't tell you if you don't have subscriptions, they don't tell you they left. So how do you know? Well, it takes an assumption. So what I do is I look at customer orders in the last two years, look at the average rhythm, and then use that to build assumptions of who's actually left you. It's not going to be 100% accurate, but it's going to be pretty good. Plus, finance has probably already done this calculation. So again, what I do is, is a simple starting point is I say somebody hasn't ordered the last year has left. And though I do, as we'll talk about in a minute, is look at what in my survey scores could have predicted that churn. 
Next is order velocity. Great point, Gene. Yeah, so non-GAAP earnings or savings, uh, ways looking at the, the earnings of the company overall, can you tie into that? Order velocity, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, what I do is I see, okay, how many orders do, again, I'll get two years of data and um, look at the sales orders. And while you're at it, try to get the overall revenue and margin per order if you can. Many organizations can track margin, but if you can, that's great. And now again, let's look at our survey, see what predicts it. And then net revenue retention, which again is going to be sales per customer for two years running to calculate that. So first of all, the step is get your data. Now, again, this can be a one-time extract. You don't need ongoing yet because we're doing this to go fishing for what matters. And then, so now change your dependent variable. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here's what your reports sound like today. Okay, the top drivers of NPS are and snooze. Your CEO kind of cares about net promoter score. Now, maybe they care a fair amount, but if you're not in healthcare, they don't make money off NPS. They don't save their job off NPS. But instead you say, the top drivers of increased orders are, well, now we're talking money. And one thing I haven't found CX people do, I'm not sure why our tribe is at our time with this. We're really good at saying, okay, here's the net promoters, here's the likelihood to recommend score. And here are the top drivers of that. The top driver is, for example, product availability. Okay. What if you swap out NPS for increases versus decreases of orders? For those who churned or those who didn't. It's the same driver analysis. You're just swapping in a financial metric instead of a survey metric. And the key thing we need to remember, as I mentioned earlier, is you can't spend NPS points. Your CEO isn't going to keep his or her job because NPS goes up, no matter how excited they are about it. That requires money. And so again, you do an NPS, a driver analysis NPS, right? So what if you switch your dependent variable to order velocity? This helps you to understand what matters against actual outcomes. Going back to that, the difference between a hopeful and a change maker is a hopeful reports on sentiment. A change maker studies and changes behaviors. And so I'll leave this third one, choose the drivers to drive change. Now, when you find out something matters, get it in your survey platform. One of the things that blew me away when I visited Roxy is that she had all the financial metrics, including cost per call in Qualtrics. When I went and visited Dow, they had my very favorite business problem, the one I want everybody in this call to have. Emily, Patty, you name it, I want you all to have this problem. See, they had a thousand licenses for their dashboard. And I was talking with Jen, who at the time was a CX leader, she's since been promoted. Um, she said that we have a thousand licenses for our dashboard and we ran out. We had to shut down the dashboards of certain lower level executives because we didn't have enough licenses. I want you all to have that problem. And that's because she brought in this other data into the dashboard. They had um, on-time delivery. They had get it right. They had all this other data. Get it right, by the way, is products on time, a right amount of product, no defects. But they bring in all this other rich data, which executives care about, and they connect it to the sentiment. Is that's using the drivers to drive change. So for example, with a client, we measured share of wallet through a survey. We asked them how much they spent in the space and how much they spent with our client. And um, found the top three drivers of share of wallet were product availability, on-time shipments, and product quality. Perceptions of each of these. Well, if you knew that, what would you do? Well, here's my advice. Okay. Number one, talk about these things nonstop because this is what's costing you money. In the case of share of wallet, it means they are spending money with your competitors 
those who are spending more with you are confident in your product availability, your ability to do on-time shipments, and your product quality. If you can help your customers feel better about these three metrics in this scenario, which is a real scenario, then you can move the needle and improve your share of wallet. Next, find the operational behavioral data that matches this. Like product availability, uh, at our conference last year, Do Be To Be Better, Ricardo started with the ATP, Availability to Promise, and used that to show how it impacted their customer experience. Uh, Sam Wegman from Univar, a distributor, similarly found that the availability to promise when somebody calls us to have this product say yes or no has a huge impact on their perceptions of customer experience. So find the operational and behavioral data that matches these. Then add this data, the financial data and the operational data to your survey platform. So you can have Dow's wonderful business problem. And lastly, drive change, create business projects to initiate that initiate projects to improve this. I'm gonna wrap up with three real world examples of ways to connect to financials. First of all is in distribution. Their executives care about margin. They discover that when a client moves from detractor to promoter, margin gets better. In fact, I was talking with the person, I'm not sharing their name because I don't have permission. Uh, he was saying that when a client moves from a detractor to, to a promoter, it means three cents per pound margin. Now, three cents per margin might not sound like much unless you're one of the largest distributors in a category. And then it's millions of dollars. So they identified the margin contribution created through NPS. Look at the top drivers NPS uh, in the data. They calculated those drivers and created a dashboard so teams could see where we're accomplishing the goal when we're not, so they could work to create more satisfaction. In their case, NPS tied directly to margin. That can be the case for everybody. Again, three cents, if you can have conversations like we can improve three cents per pound if we move somebody from a detractor to a promoter, that's using NPS for good. A manufacturing example, uh, this is what I talked about earlier, uh, share of wallets, what they measure, and they do that through a survey. Best predictor is product availability. So they started building automated communications on the inventory levels. So customers knew where the product was available. Now the organization at first was not all on board this because they might chase away sales, but the CX team was able to prove that through a test, it actually improved sales. Built proactive communication of back orders, and then maybe a little controversial, when uh, delivery got constrained, they understood who are the most important customers are, and they prioritized those customers to get the product. And a third example would be manufacturing. Those who read my book may know who I'm talking about here. Their executives care about repeat sales and margin. And they found the best predictor was how long it takes to resolve a complaint. Well, if you could tie how long it takes to resolve a complaint into repeat sales and margin, by the way, notice there's no survey there. It's data to data, as our CX team here did. They mapped the complaints journey to find out what was going wrong and what customers wanted from it. We helped them with that. As a result, they carved out a specific complaints team. They couldn't add headcount, they moved headcount out and they reduced the average length of complaints from 30 to 1.5 days. And were able to prove the sales lift as a result of their work. So here are three examples. Here's a bonus fourth one. Um, this is a B2B to C example, life insurance. Uh, we, we are looking right now at sales velocity is what they care about, getting them to order more as well as um, churn. And so actively as we're talking, we are bringing in the sales data, combining it with the survey. So we can say, what are the biggest drivers of increases in sales? And what are the biggest drivers in churn? Now we know from brain science that what drives churn, an unhappy outcome, is typically done in a different part of the brain than what drives happiness. And so I expect the driver analysis from churn to be, result in different outcomes than those that drive increases in sales. We'll see. All right, let me open up the questions. You've got the Q&A tab there. I'd love to see your questions and we'll wrap up uh, coming up here, but let me get your questions. 
We have a couple of questions in the Q&A here, Jim. Okay. Um, first, let's start with a question on revenue. How do you overcome the obstacles of economic factors and things like pricing changes? Sometimes revenue has gone up year over year, but more because we raised prices or because our costs have increased, for example. All right. It happens all the time. The good news is you don't necessarily have to care. Here's what you're looking for. You're looking for, so when you increase your prices, some customers stay and some leave, right? Likely. What you want to understand is what's driving those who stay and spend more for whatever reason. Price increase is just another reason to spend more. And so the cause, it's good to know that. When you're doing the analysis, it's less important to know that all that happened. You just want to know who is spending more with you. Now, let me break the other part. Um, okay, so, so you make uh, uh, airline part. So yes, let me acknowledge on an individual level, clients stay, clients leave. That can always be explained one off, or at least often. But when you have enough sample, when you're getting three to 400 clients, you can actually factor a lot of that out and looking for what's happening across the board. Again, you will always be able to say, well, this one left because of that. This one had a merger. Um, but with enough sample size, that washes out and you can tie your survey scores into those results. Great. And where do you start to calculate cost to serve if you don't have a call center? All right, so that's the easiest point. It clearly is. Um, one example I've used, I wrote about this in my book, um, is a software company, doesn't have a call center, looking at implementations. If you can shorten implementations by two weeks, well, what you can do then is that you can look at the cost of your implementation team. HR might be able to give you how much it costs per person, probably not, but you can make assumptions. Let's say there's six people implementation team, an average of fully loaded $150,000 per person. Well, that gives us $900,000 a year, which means roughly $1,750 a week. So if you can shorten the um, implementation by two weeks, then that's $3,500 per implementation. So you can't, don't always have the nice neat numbers like a call center. But if you start breaking down where you're improving the operations and then use that to drive. Uh, complaints is another one. If you can calculate um, how long it takes to resolve a complaint and can shorten that, like the one example from 30 to 1.5 days, if you start making some assumptions about how much people's time it takes to resolve that complaint in the before and after, you can tie it back to salaries. But you're looking for numbers you can find to show the ROI. Uh, go ahead, Lisa. How would you recommend we utilize these KPIs if we are more of an individual contributor and not one of the key players doing the KPI analysis? Well. So that's a great question. Many of us in customer experience are individuals. Uh, we did a survey three years ago at the CX, with the CXBA. We found that a third of programs had one person in charge. So you're not alone on that. Um, but in that case, then, you, what I'm talking about is not necessarily high-level analysis. Uh, driver analysis is. But presumably, you have somebody doing that. Or actually, um, if you have Qualtrics, for example, you can actually put all that into Qualtrics and let it do the driver analysis. Now, I'm sure any um, quantitative analysts or statisticians on the line are going to be uh, but probably putting some notes in the chat right now. But if you're an individual, use the tools you have. And if you have, I know um, Forrester can do this. I imagine Medallia can as well. Um, if you can use the tools to do a driver analysis, you can do this. But the main thing is you can talk to the CE, CFO or at least in somebody in finance as an individual contributor and try to get their help. Get them to include your data in theirs and then you can do more of that work for you or find a friend in operations. Uh, I'm going a little off topic here, but 
Um, Dave Seaton, a friend of mine, wrote a couple months ago about CX is the loneliest profession. And I've written that too. Um, at the time, Lisa and I were out in, uh, out in Nashville with a program we have called the Fellowship, which has a half dozen more advanced CX leaders. So I asked them, I said, are you lonely? I'm like, no, why would we be lonely? The biggest difference was they're out talking to the business all the time. Uh, I was talking with Brian, who leads customer experience with AAA. He says, he's, I said, I heard a rumor. You spend 60% of your time out there talking with the business instead of doing CX work. He says, not true. It's more like 80%. When we find that CX leaders are effective, it's because they're out spending their time across the organization, building that goodwill. While you're doing it, anonymous attendee, uh, I would say then um, do that. Find a friend who could help you with the analysis. Now, um, the, uh, what tools and technologies are, I'll, I'll jump to this with Lisa. What tools and technologies are folks using to help enable this work? Um, it's not high-end tools. It's driver analysis, which could be done with SPSS or again, using Qualtrics. It's mostly learning how to talk in dollars. I, I do not have an advanced analytics degree or even am very good at it, but by doing some basic assumptions and validating them with finance, that's where it begins. Now, tools help you do it better. This is more about a mindset, about getting comfortable talking about what the organization cares about. The organization cares about dollars, and so it's being curious. Lisa, do we have one last question? Yes, let's do one more here. So um, Kelsey says, I love the idea of figuring out the key drivers of financial outcomes. People seem to assume reduced time on site means happier customers, but some people take more time. How do you make sure X and O data drives financial outcomes, um, just not operational data? And what survey questions are key to ask to understand customer drivers or drivers' jobs to be done? Oh, Kelsey, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, First of all, sample size is your friend. Coming back to the saying earlier, if you, you know, I made the assumption that shortening implementation by two weeks is a good thing, you're challenging that, which is fantastic because it may not always be. But if you do 12, 15 implementations a year, then you can start to get enough sample to seeing it is. There will be some that need longer. You're looking at shortening the average. And you're looking at doing this not because you're just going to spend less time. But by identifying that implementation is the biggest driver of the customer experience, which in technology it often is, not just technology, but technology it often is. Therefore, if we can do the implementation more efficiently, we can be done faster, not spend less time. We could be done faster with the client, which then allows us to save money. You're calling out a key difference. It's not just about saving money. It's about creating an environment where we don't need to spend the money. Come back to said earlier, you want to create an environment where customers want to spend more, stay longer, interact in ways less expensive to serve. This fits in that last year. You want to create an outcome where customers are happy to have you done sooner. Um, and so then um, that should tie into the finances. Be right. You're doing this because it's the right thing for the customer which then comes back to help the company. And that's what we should all be working for, those joint wins. Uh, survey questions are, yes, uh, jobs to be done is a great example, um, but it's tying back to what the customers care about. In that scenario, uh, customers might feel, I have confidence I, know how, confidence, I know how to use the tools. That's a common outcome you're trying to create in implementation. So in that case, it's not a job to be done, but it's going back to what drives, what motivates your customers and asking those questions. All right, well, let's wrap up here. Again, those three drivers, three things we focus on as a change maker. First of all, go fishing for data. Talk to your finance group, work with operations, learn what matters here. We know finance and operations are the most important um, people for the CEO. So let's go ahead and look at that. Next, change your dependent variable. The same thing you're doing for likelihood to recommend, do for financial outcomes, do for operational outcomes, and then use those drivers to drive change. Now, again, I do want you to bring that data into your platform, 
We do that in all of our implementations um, so that you can do this ongoing. Uh, so now one last poll. Let's hear how you're feeling at this point. My goal is not to have you fully operational after 45 minutes, but to give you some of the tools, things to think about on how you can start to put some of this work into work at your place. All right, getting there, it's early. I get it, I get it, and I can't wait to start. Excellent, fantastic. Uh, last wrap up here, we've got um, three more webinars coming up in June, July, and August. Save those dates. We'll send this out so you can have it there on your computer. And save time for September 12th, 2023. Uh, the Do B2B Better Conference, you can still get the early bird, $50 off. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is bring in, we have one speaker finalized, which is Roxy Stromenger. I mentioned her earlier. She's going to talk about emotions in the B2B experience. I hope we see you there.